Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. things that happens with people who are so quick to edit, either editing while they write or soon after, is that they don't often realize that they are picking the world's worst time to edit because they are too familiar with it. So they've done the thinking, they've done the planning, they've done the researching, they've done the writing for goodness sakes. They have no perspective they are not going to be able to see the question at the back of their readers' minds. They're not going to be able to anticipate that. And so therefore, they're not going to be a really good self-editor. So a really key part of my system is to ensure that people take a good break from writing before they start the editing. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with the author of Stand for Something, Brian Burkhart, and with the author of Win or Die, Leadership Secrets from Game of Thrones, Bruce Craven, then do go listen into them. But only after you've listened to today's conversation because I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Daphne Gray Grant. Daphne grew up in the newspaper business. Her parents owned a weekly where she worked from the age of 16, even while completing her tertiary studies. Eventually, she left the family business to become a senior editor at a major metropolitan daily, the Vancouver Sun, where she worked for 10 years. After the birth of her triplet children in 1994, yes, three in one, that was a challenge and she decided to become a communications consultant and a writing and editing coach. She's the author of Eight and a Half Steps to Writing Faster and Better and also Your Happy First Draft. Daphne has been blogging since 2006 and hosting a YouTube channel since 2017. She strongly believes that the main reason people can't write and can't write quickly is because the school system hasn't given them the simple tools to do it. Her popular and free weekly newsletter, Power Writing, goes to thousands of readers around the world every Tuesday morning. In our discussion, Daphne talked to me about how to build a happier and healthier writing habit by starting small. We talked about why it's important to separate the writing from the editing and also take a break in between these separate activities. And we discussed the value of asking questions. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Daphne Gray Grant. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and today I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast from Vancouver in Canada, Daphne Gray Grant. She's a writing and editing coach who works with writers around the world, helping them to write faster and better. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Daphne. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Thanks, Jürgen. Great to be here. Janine Kelbuck, who was our guest on episode 382 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you and she introduced us. So a big hello to Janine. Hi, Janine. Thanks for doing this. 
Now, you kind of grew up in the newspaper industry. You sort of were a journalist and publisher of newspapers, and then you, you helped other people writing and editing. So what, what is it that drives you now to help other people with their writing and editing? And how, how did your experience in the newspaper industry shape what you do? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think the thing for me was that I was probably born to be a teacher. And <laughs> when I was in high school and university, I knew I was really interested in teaching, but I couldn't wrap my mind around having to do the same thing all the time. I think I kind of envisioned a grade four teacher. <laughs> and I thought, how can people bear doing that for 25 or 30 years? And I just didn't pursue teaching because of that and ended up in the newspaper business because of my family history. So my father owned a struggling weekly newspaper. I always want to work that adjective struggling into there because <laughs> I don't want anyone to think I was a Patty Hearst. You know, we mm. didn't have tons of money, um, but I worked in that business for a number of years. And then from there, graduated to the daily newspaper business. So I worked as a senior editor for a large metropolitan daily newspaper for about seven or so years. And then within that company, I went on to become a senior manager on the business side. And then I found myself pregnant with triplets. <laughs> and uh, after the kids were... That would have been... Yeah, they say when, when your first child, um, when you're about to have your first child, that's a pretty life-changing experience. And I can certainly <laughs> attest to that part. But boy, uh, triplets, that's uh, you don't do things by halves. <laughs> no, I don't do things by halves. A friend of mine sent me an email at the time and said, um, you have blistering efficiency. <laughs> so that's the way I kind of saw that. And in fact, it was my kid's birthday just yesterday. So we celebrated mm. their 27th birthday yesterday. Oh, happy and, birthday um, to all three of them. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. And so after they were born, I did go back to the newspaper business very briefly, but there happened to be a buyout offer on the table at that point. And, uh, I thought I should just take the money and run. So that's what I did. And uh, I started my own business after that, basically working as a freelance editor and writer for a couple of years. And uh, when my kids were very young and when I was doing that, I kind of thought, you know, maybe I could set up my own business where I'm teaching other writers and editors how to do the work a little bit better. One of the things I discovered when I left the newspaper business was that I didn't have a really healthy or effective writing habit myself. Writing was one of those things I was not born enjoying doing. I was a natural editor. I was really, really good at editing and really fast at it. And when I was in high school and university, frequently edited the papers of my friends as a kind of a favor to them. Always enjoyed it, never felt like work to me. I just had a lot of natural aptitude for editing, but very, very little natural aptitude for writing. <laughs> and so when I left the newspaper business and started writing and editing professionally, one of the things I discovered was how much I truly disliked writing and how difficult it was to do for other people financially, because, you know, if you're doing it by the hour, if it's taking you two hours or 10 hours to do something that you ought to be able to do in 30 minutes, you can't charge people for all that time. And so what I did was I stepped back for about a year. I did a lot of editing, but I stepped back from the writing business and figured out how to write faster, more effectively, more efficiently. And then once I'd figured that out, decided that I could make a business teaching other people how to do the same thing. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. I guess there's, there's a bunch of thoughts that were going through my mind there as, as you were telling that or describing that journey. And, and the obvious one first is the difference between editing and writing. So if you you, know, you you said you were a, a natural editor. You had an aptitude. You had a, you really enjoyed doing it, and yet writing felt so difficult. Uh, why is writing and editing completely different in that sense? Well, I think the thing I would say is that it uses different parts of the brain. 
And one of the things that happens in Western society is that we are really well trained to use the critical part of our brain. And by that, I don't mean the most important part. I mean the part that criticizes us mm. and other people. That's our prefrontal cortex. And we're highly rewarded for using it in the business world and in the academic world. So both those worlds love it when we're critical about things, figure out the problems, um, work at making things better. That's a very linear, logical task. And it's not terribly creative. There's another separate part of our brain that's really creative, good at inventing things, solving problems, you know, doing that kind of stuff that's hard to pin down. And what happens is if you're really good at using the critical part of your brain, that's the part of the brain you want to use all the time. Hmm. And so if you are constantly being critical while you're trying to write, it's very, very hard to write. And so what I do now is I teach people how to turn off that critical part of their brain so they can allow the creative part of their brain to flourish. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I know you talk quite a bit about um, when you're writing, you shouldn't be editing, and that, that's the the critique most people have. And, and I guess even before I um, discovered your work and, and was reading about that, I, I was aware that if I corrected myself, I would slow down. And I always had this... Um, I guess one of the smartest things I ever did in my life <laughs> is, was way, way, way back in university, and this is a long time ago, they used to offer summer schools and one year, just for the hell of it, for, I don't know what prompted me to do this, I took a touch typing course on an old keyboard typewriter and learnt over the summer holidays in this summer school to touch type and, um, of course, that's come uh, come in very useful now <laughs> with the advent of computers. The key thing, though, that I wanted to highlight was one of the things they taught you in that touch typing, um, and of course, in the old days of typewriter, it was really important, was just type the stuff and come back and correct it at the end. Don't correct as you go. And I found this quite challenging at the beginning because I would type and I would actually have a vision in my mind, even though I wasn't watching the the paper, uh, I would have a vision in my mind of what key I'd hit once I'd sort of learnt the keys. And so, you know, there'd, there'd be this alarm go off every now and then saying, hey, you've hit the wrong key here, you, you misspelled that word. You know? and, and, and I would sort of go back and do the correction. And I learnt very quickly, hey, that was going to slow me right down. So it, that was something I took away from that typing lesson that, you know, while you're typing, you don't correct. You come back and correct later. Yeah, well, what a useful lesson. And it's so interesting that you should raise typing right now because one <laughs> of the things I do when people join my writing program is I always ask them about their typing speed. And this is a little bit ironic because when I worked in the newspaper business, those of us there used to have this joke. When we came across a really bad piece of writing, we used to say, that isn't writing, that's typing. <laughs> and that was kind of a joke we used to make fun of people who we felt mm. didn't know how to write. But the thing is that if you can type well, and by that I mean being a touch typist, which incidentally is not a phrase young people always understand nowadays. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who don't understand it, that means typing without having to look at the keys. Mm. If you are a really good touch typist, you are going to be a better writer. And the theory behind that is because your hands can keep up with how fast your brain operates. Our brains are really like supercomputers that are attached to our bodies via our necks. And if we can keep up with that supercomputer, then we are going to be able to write better. What happens with many people is that they don't have a hope of keeping up with how fast the, the supercomputer that is their brain mm -hmm. operates. So one of the first things I do is I get people to work on some typing a little bit a day, just five minutes a day. And over many weeks, you can dramatically increase your typing speed. And that's going to help your writing. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating when I read read your thoughts on, on typing and, and using that in writing, because there is a school of thought that says, uh, as writers, 
you should go back to pen and paper and and i certainly have a um, a booklet that i use and i've got some lovely lamy pens that i love using i've had um, half of them for a long long time um, and i like to sit down and write but i don't necessarily find that it helps the quality of my writing it's merely just the tactile feel of it and it's a kind of a relaxing thing for me it's not because it's actually improving my writing skills and and so I was curious to find out what your thoughts on that was, um, you know, writing with pen and paper versus the typing. Yes, I'm asked about that a lot, and I'm pleased to be able to say there's been research on this topic. And one of the things a social science researcher did, I can't remember the dates of this, but they grabbed a bunch of school students, I think they were in grade six, something like that, who didn't know how to type, and they gave them a writing test. And then following that, they took half of those kids and gave them intensive typing instruction. And then following something like six weeks of that, they put all the kids back in the classroom, gave them another writing test, not a typing test, a writing test. And they found that those who had learned how to type dramatically improved their scores on writing. So mm -hmm. that's where the the conclusion is that if you know how to type, you're going to be able to write better. Now, before I go any further down that path, I want to say that there is a time when a paper and pen or pencil is much better for you. And that time is when you are thinking or planning or trying to sort things out. And then that relaxed feeling that you just described, Jurgen, that's really, really useful to mm. you. And that's, uh, that's something I really want people to encourage. So when you are thinking and planning, don't do it at your desk. Don't do it at typewriter. Go to a comfortable chair. Don't go to a couch. Stretch out. Go to a hammock. Go somewhere where you can really relax and let your mind wander in any direction it wants to go. That's when you're going to get the really interesting stuff. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's that, that's reminded me, of course, of, of mind mapping. And I saw that you're, you're a big fan of mind mapping. I've always been a huge fan of mind mapping. Um, I had the privilege of attending an in-person event with Tony Busan back in the 1980s. Mm. And I actually learned to juggle in in a morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably the most uncoordinated person uh, I, that <laughs> on the planet. But he... He um, used that metaphor of learning to juggle as not just that you can learn a new skill uh, from scratch, but also how he, he used it to demonstrate how the brain works and how the, the neurons connected and how you strengthen those connections. And then he talked about the mind mapping. So, yeah, I, I was really fascinated to hear that you're a big fan of mind mapping. So how do, how do you bring mind mapping into your writing? Well, tell well, us a little bit about mind mapping for those listeners that, that may not know exactly what it is. Right, right. So just to summarize the high points, mind mapping is a technique where you take a piece of paper, you turn it sideways, you write something in the middle of the page. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute because that's <laughs> yes, that's where I differ a little bit from Tony Buzzin. Um, and then you let your mind go in any direction and you capture it all on the page. And so this technique is very relaxed, very easygoing, very freeing, and it allows, it allows you to connect with your creative brain and go off in different directions so that you can come up with what I like to describe as the aha experience. So I like to use mind mapping as a way to inspire myself to write, and that's what I teach the people in my group to do as well. Now, the thing I've, the, the little finer point to mind mapping that I've developed over many years of teaching it to other people is Tony Buzzin always said what you should write in the center of the page is your topic. And I have fine tuned that a little bit. I suggest people write a question in the center of the page, not a topic, a question. A couple of benefits associated with a question. First of all, it's much more specific than a topic. So you're going to be going in a certain direction if you ask a question. That's very helpful to most writers. 
The second benefit of a question is that we are hardwired as human beings to want to answer questions. Hmm. If I if I put a topic on the page or if I give you a topic verbally, eh, you might or might not be inspired to say something about it. But if I ask you a question, your brain is going to be desperate to answer it. And that's very helpful to people who are mind mapping. Asking a question really, really helps set them in the right direction in terms of mind mapping. Yeah, yeah, I love now, it. Another thing I would say about mind mapping that I do that's perhaps a little bit different from the way Tony Buzzin described it is that I encourage people to mind map multiple times until they have what I describe as the aha experience. And that aha experience is, oh, now I know what I want to say. And as mm -hmm. soon as you have that experience, that experience of feeling like I really want to start writing now, that's terrific because the mind map has done its job. So one of the things I explain to people in my program is that a mind map is not like an outline. Just because you've written something on your mind map doesn't mean you have to write about it in your finished piece. And at the same time, because you haven't put something on your mind map doesn't mean you can't write about it in your finished piece. It's not an outline. It's just a tool that you use to inspire yourself. So keep mind mapping. A good mind map should take three to five minutes to do. It shouldn't be a time-consuming, lengthy procedure. It should be really fast and fun. And then if that first mind map doesn't give you the aha experience, then do a second one on a different question. Maybe use the first mind map to determine what the second question is going to be. But uh, don't just stop at one if you haven't had the aha experience. Do a second one. And if the second one doesn't give you the aha experience, do a third. And if the third one doesn't give you the aha experience, do a fourth. You know, there is no, uh, there's nothing to stop you from doing multiple mind maps. And for many people, the act of doing more than one is intensely helpful. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's really just uh, expanding on ideas in, in that process you've described, isn't it? And I love the idea of the question because it's kind of like the Zyganic loop, isn't it? It's, it's sort of opened up that that loop and we need to close it. I know um, recently I've been on um, some writing workshops where um, this is, um, I can't remember the technique um, that she uses. This is Terry Trespicio. I don't know if you know Terry Trespicio. Oh, she's, been a, she's been a guest on the show and she has the gateless method. That's what it's called, the gateless method. And and she starts off, I mean, there's a whole lot of other things in that method, but she starts off with a question. So, I was, you know, you've reminded me of that. And I thought, well, uh, because I, if somebody gives me a topic, I'm, I struggle to write something. Yes. Uh, but I found, you know, she asked a question and immediately I'm, oh, I could write about this or I could write about that. Uh, so, And the question's structured in a way that it's open-ended enough that you can, you know, you can pick from various different life experiences or things that are going on. Um, it's not, you're not locked into a to specific topic. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, questions are great. They're, they're really mm. inspirational. Yeah. All right. Now, um, I, I'd like to come back to this writing versus editing thing. Um, and and ha so we've established, I guess, how that it's important to separate writing from editing because, you know, it's, the, it just slows you down when you're correcting as you go and then you lose your train of thought also mm -hmm. um, which is where the mind mapping part helps because it kind of right. gives a bit of structure to the idea um now how do you how do you kind of turn off that critical faculty in your mind while you're in this while you want to be in this creative um space and and write okay well i have one trick people sometimes gasp when i tell this to them <laughs> but I write in three-point type. So three-point type is too small to read, even with glasses, which I wear. And if you're writing in three-point type, you will not be able to read it, and therefore you will not be able to edit it. Mm. Problem solved. <laughs> That's interesting. It, it That's... works almost instantaneously. Yeah. It's a little bit like, although this is different, it, this is, um, uh, I can't remember the name of this tool, but 
as you're typing, um, if you stop typing, it erases oh, yes. stuff off the, <laughs> off the yes. screen, but you actually lose it. So it's Yes, that's right like, or die, I think. That's yeah, right. yeah, I tried it out and I thought, well, <laughs> it's kind of, you get halfway down the page and, and suddenly you, you hesitate for a moment, you've lost all your work. Boom, so it's thought, gone. Oh, yeah, that's very not, alarming. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I like that one. But yeah, I like the, the small type, you know, because that uh, stops you actually reading mm -hmm. reading back yeah. yes that works really well hmm. and w what are your thoughts because you talked earlier about uh you know keeping up with the processing speed of of our mind what are your thoughts about speaking speaking out your thoughts uh, oh as a first dictating, dictating writing is a really good way to go for many people hmm. i have helped so many people make the transition from writing by typing to writing by speaking voice activation software is terrific my big problem is that i'm on a mac and the software i used to use uh dragon dictate stopped being supported by mac mm. or they stopped making them compatible really really irritating to me because i had become extra fast being able to dictate my words and um, I really miss being able to do that. I know there are ways to dictate using a Mac, but I haven't uh, found it as compatible as Dragon Dictate was for me. But anyone on a, on a Windows machine, I strongly encourage you to, if, if you want to give it a try, try dictating. It really works well. And um, it's not cheating. It's not doing anything <laughs> wrong. It's a great technique that many people can use very, very happily. I recently had a guy in my program who was writing a book and uh, he had had a great deal of difficulty writing for many years and uh, i got him set up with dictating and boom he got the book mm. done very very quickly yeah 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 i think i think there's a time and place for it um and and, and certainly if people have trouble typing or if they, they're not fast typists mm -hmm. the i um i looked into drag and dictate when i had um when i fractured my collarbone and um mm. i couldn't couldn't type and wow. I looked into Dragon Dictate so I could keep working while I was healing and I never really became friends with it. Um, in fact, I found that one-handed typing worked better for me. So I kind of gave gave up on it. But recently we've come across this tool called Descript, which the, the purpose of that is actually to transcribe audio for um, and we use it a lot for editing podcasting and now you can do videos as well and it's a fabulous editing tool ah but one thing you can do with it and and i we started using that and i thought i've got all this i've got all these videos and audio clips that i've done just off the top of my head and then shared the video or shared the audio somewhere I'll just dump them in there and, and that'll give me the written version of, of that article and I can repurpose that content somewhere. And then I realized, well, if I have a thought, I should just dictate it in there quickly because sometimes, you know, I won't write the things out. I'll have, say, a, a two-minute video or a three-minute video that will be a nice little um, social media post or something like that. So I've started using Descript actually as, as, a, trans, um, as a dictation tool as well as the other things that's fantastic I, I will just make one comment about dragon dictate in case there are listeners to this podcast who have it and like you didn't feel that they mm. could be friends with it i had that exact same experience myself i have chronic back pain and and my doctor thought that dictating would be helpful for that um he worried that it was the typing that was mm. irritating my back and I had tried Dragon a couple of years ago, and it really didn't work for me very well. And so I thought, and the doctor was kind of nagging me about it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to hire a consultant. So I found a consultant, a Dragon consultant. I paid for one hour of her time, so it wasn't expensive at all. And in the first three minutes, <laughs> she explained to me the problem, which was that I had an older version of Dragon, and that particularly for the Mac, older versions of Dragon were really, really bad. And at the point I had hired her, she said, oh, there's a really great new version of Dragon. You just need to upgrade. So I upgraded and she was right. It was fantastic. And then she gave me this quick session of the commands, et cetera, how to make it work for me. And 
it was fantastic. I had no problems with Dragon after that. So mm -hmm. now for anyone on a Mac, it's not going to work anymore. But if you are on yeah. Windows mm -hmm. and haven't been comfortable with Dragon, get a consultant to help you because um, it, it really is fast and easy and it, it should not be a problem, provided you have the most recent version. Yeah, and, and also uh, that there is a learning phase to it and the software itself learns. Uh, mm -hmm. And I suspect that in the, the physical and emotional condition I was in at the time, yes, I probably, yes. I probably <laughs> didn't have the patience to, to go through that learning phase. Yes, indeed. But one thing I will say about that is that the software learns faster now than it did five or 10 years ago. Mm. I, I did not find, you know, when I was trying to do it many years ago, I found the time to teach the software very, very painful, but it's not that way now. The software learns really quickly now. Hmm. That's great. All right. Well, let, let's take a step back in terms of, of writing and talk about, well, I guess procrastination, because people talk a lot about writer's mm. block. I've got yeah. writer's block. And I know I've used the term myself as well. And it, it, it kind of it happens to me when I sit down, okay, I must write something today. Um, and I'm just not in the mood or, or the environment isn't right or something else is going on on my mind, you know, that's occupying my thoughts. And, and, and so I'm just not really paying enough attention to it. But I know you've got a theory that there's no such thing as writer's block and it's probably more <laughs> to do with procrastination. So tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I tend to agree with Terry Pratchett, the writer Terry Pratchett, who said, Writer's block was just in a term invented by people in California who didn't want to write. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I kind of tend to agree with that. Um, in terms of procrastination, I've worked with a lot of people who told me that they were procrastinators. And generally, when they confess this to me, they often suggest that the heart of the problem is that they're really very lazy. And, you know, one of the things I always say to them is that in my experience, procrastinators are not doing it out of laziness. The reason people procrastinate is one of two things. Either they have given themselves too daunting a job. So for example, if they're writing a book, they keep thinking, I have to write 70,000 or 80,000 words. Well, who wouldn't get freaked out by having to write 70 or 80,000 words? That's an awful lot of words. So that's the first problem. They've taken on a job that's too daunting, too big, too frightening, or they haven't developed a healthy and happy writing process. So if people fall into that category, I like to say to them, look, if I had the instruction to bang my head against a brick wall every morning, that would cause my head to bleed and it would give me a headache and therefore I wouldn't want to do it my procrastinating about banging my head against a brick wall would be a smart decision. Hmm. And many people who haven't developed a healthy, happy writing process don't write because it's too unhappy for them. It's too uncomfortable. And their decision not to write, they might call it procrastination, but in fact, they're making a really sharp cost-benefit decision saying, this act of writing is going to make me feel uncomfortable and unhappy. Therefore, I don't want to do it. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Smart decision if they, mm. if they don't have a happy way to write. So I always think my main job is to help them make their writing practice happier and healthier. And, and that's what I help them do. So the way to do that in brief is to write for only a very short amount of time but do it every day because writing is one of those jobs. It's a little bit like exercise. It requires some conditioning. So Jürgen, if I were to say to you tomorrow, I want you to go run a marathon. Hmm. What would you say to me? <laughs> yeah. No, cool. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm going to procrastinate over that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you haven't been training. Mm. You haven't been training for a marathon. And you know, to train for a marathon, I, I don't know what the minimum of time is, but I think for someone who's already running, you can't possibly do it in less than six weeks of training. And, mm -hmm. and it's probably more like six months. 
Maybe it's three months for someone who's relatively healthy. I don't know, but it's a significant amount of training time. The number of people who come to me and say they want to write for two hours a day is quite large. And many of them are shocked when I say, no, that's too much. You mm. cannot start with two hours a day. You can't even start with one hour a day. That's also too much. Generally speaking, I try to get people to start with 15 minutes. 15 minutes is an ample amount of time for writing. You don't need to do more. And not infrequently, I'm working with people who have some trauma associated with writing. For anyone who fits into that category, I start them with one to five minutes. Hmm. That's plenty of time for anyone who has writing trauma. I remember a couple of years ago working with a woman who was doing her doctoral dissertation and she had to write 100,000 words. And she was a mess when she came to me. And so I said to her, you're going to start with five minutes, no more than five minutes. Now she had 100,000 words to write, <laughs> but five minutes was, with, was what we started with. And she didn't advance beyond five minutes for the first three months. So three months of working at five minutes a day. And then once she got to those three months, she was gradually able to ratchet up the amount of time she spent writing. Now, she eventually, she finished her dissertation. She was very happy. She's now working as a postdoc somewhere here in Canada. She came to Vancouver where I live about a year after finishing it. And I took her out for coffee and we had a very pleasant conversation about what her experience had been. And then she told me the whole story. And my goodness, it was horrifying. She had, was one of those people, she sailed through her undergrad degree, sailed through her master's degree, you know, got A's, straight A's, everything she did. Everyone was always happy with her, impressed with her work. And then when she got to do her PhD, one, one of her professors took her aside and said, it's really too bad you don't know how to write. You're going to have a hard time doing your dissertation. <laughs> and this terribly thoughtless comment planted a bad seed in my client's head. She failed her comprehensives as a result. She was so thrown by this because she'd never had this kind of feedback ever before. She failed her comprehensives. She ended up redoing her comprehensives. But she was terrified after that. And so that's when she came to me. I'm I'm kind of glad she didn't tell me this whole story beforehand. Because <laughs> yes. I think I would have been even more alarmed. But anyways, <laughs> this process of starting really, really small allowed her to recover her composure and finish the 100,000 word dissertation and eventually graduate. So starting small is a really key technique for a great many people, certainly anyone who's experienced any trauma associated with writing. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the marathon uh, metaphor is a really good one there too because it, it's not just the starting small bit, but the consistency then mm -hmm. to do that. And, and you know, if you do five minutes a day for six months every day, how, how, many, how many is that? So let's say six, three is 180. So that's 180 by five minutes. So yes. you've, got, you've got several hours worth of writing there already. Yeah. And, that, and that could well be quite a significant chunk of whatever project you're working on. Mm -hmm. I, exactly. It's exactly mm. true. Yeah. I often find um, sitting down, I, I will set myself 10 minutes or so and I'll sit down and I'll write and i'll um it'll be five minutes sometimes even almost 10 minutes and i just don't know what to write but once i get going then it's kind of like you know i could go for half an hour or an hour um, mm -hmm. once i'm underway because then all of a sudden some some idea has developed and it starts to connect with other ideas and exactly exactly this is another metaphor i like to use in which writing is so similar to exercise runners will frequently give themselves the rule that even on a day where they don't feel like running, hmm. they have to put on their shoes and they have to go out and run two blocks. And they get to the end of the two blocks and they think, I feel like doing more now. So they hmm. do. And the same thing can be true of writing. If you resolve to write for five minutes a day and you get to the end of five minutes and you want to do more, 
then do more. But you don't have to if you don't feel like it. Hmm. Yeah, that that's a, a good one because I was and, and I can't remember in what context this was. I was reading something, I think in a book, and it said don't don't think about um so it was just take the first step. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. sit down sit down with a blank sheet of paper and get open your pen and start yeah. writing some words. That's yeah. uh, don't think about anything else. And if if you've done that, you've succeeded, that's fine. Um, and and I thought of that, and in fact, I thought of it this morning because I uh, like to get out and ride my bike every morning, and usually it's an hour's ride, thirty kilometres. And I woke up this morning, and I thought, well, I feel <laughs> I feel a bit tired. I think I might just roll over and go to bed. But the 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 met analogy that I use there is the first step: just get out of bed. Yes. Just get up. Yeah. and then just get dressed so it's just the next thing and and once i've done that i've succeeded exactly. and then of course once i'm dressed then okay now take the bike outside and then i've succeeded with that and then of course i ended up doing the hours ride and i feel quite good at the end of the hour which i wouldn't have had that whole experience had i succumbed to the uh, i think i'll just turn over and go back to sleep well exactly and you know another thing you're talking about right now makes me reflect on a book i read recently and that i'm working to incorporate into my own coaching practice the book is called chatter and it's by ethan cross and it's about how we all talk to ourselves every day mm often in very negative ways. I've written about that a lot before, but the information in his book was so intriguing to me. First of all, the statistics are incredible. The number of words we will say to ourselves when we're talking, you know, inside our own brain, not aloud, but silently, 4,000 words a minute. 4,000 <laughs> words a minute. We speak ver uh, out loud at a rate of 150 words per minute. 4,000 words per minute. And most of that stuff is negative. Hmm. And so he has a couple of really good suggestions that I encourage, I'm starting to encourage my clients to use. The one I like best is the idea of talking to yourself in the third person. So when I don't feel like doing something, I can say to myself, Daphne, come on, you can do this. Hmm. Way better to talk in the third person than to talk in the first person. I can do this. You get a little bit more distance when mm. you talk in the third person, and that's apparently very, very helpful to overcoming the negative chatter we tend to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can relate to that because I think it's it's a level of dissociation. So mm -hmm. you, you can, you know, you, you're passing judgment on somebody else, and and yes, so it's not exactly. as bad. Yes, exactly, mm. exactly. Yeah. All right. Now, um, one of the um, one of your writing projects was your book, your Happy First Draft, and and I'm, I know your philosophy around that is, you know, the first draft you should get the first draft out as quickly as possible and not fuss. And we've talked about editing and versus writing. So tell us more about the philosophy behind uh, the Happy First Draft. Well, I guess the main thing is that I noticed how with my own writing process, the main reason I disliked it so much was because I insisted on editing while I wrote. And so once I broke myself of that habit, my own writing process became so much happier and so much more fluent and so much easier and faster. And so basically, I developed a program that allows me to help other people write fast in that way. And then what you do is you get that first draft out as happily and quickly as you can. Mm. And then you earmark a good amount of time for editing it. One of the things I like to say to people is when you're writing that first draft, you should have no concerns about quality whatsoever. And it's interesting to me when I begin working with clients, how they have a hard time letting go of that concept. I have a client who's relatively new right now, and they report into me each day via a website. And um, he's always saying things like, I'm really not very comfortable with the quality of what I'm <laughs> writing. And I keep writing him back little notes saying, don't worry about quality. Your only job is to produce quantity right now. But if you can produce that quantity and then put it aside for a while, let it rest, let it incubate, 
and then go back to it and really edit the heck out of it, that's how you're going to get a much, much higher quality product. So you want to have ample time for editing, but after you've gotten that first draft on the page and indeed after you've had time to set it aside for a while so that you can essentially become a little bit unfamiliar with it again yourself. Because one of the things that happens with people who are so quick to edit, either editing while they write or soon after, is that they don't often realize that they are picking the world's worst time to edit mm. because mm. they are too familiar with it. So yeah. they've done the thinking, they've done the planning, they've done the researching, they've done the writing for goodness sakes. They have no perspective. They are not going to be able to see the question at the back of their reader's minds. They're not going to be able to anticipate that. And so therefore they're not going to be a really good self editor. So a really key part of my system is to ensure that people take a good break from writing before they start the editing. Now, with people who write books, this is generally not a problem because a book is going to be 70,000 to 100,000 words. And so by the time they write the last word, they're going to be well past the six weeks I recommend that they, that they wait. For people who are doing something like blog posts, so I also work with people who are blogging, it's a little bit more of a problem. But for someone in that situation, I recommend taking as much time as they possibly can. Um, usually people can take at least a full day before they have to publish something. And even then, I recommend that they do something highly distracting before they get to the work of editing. So that could be writing something else, editing something else, doing some administrivia like email or filing or accounts, whatever it is you want to do. But distract yourself before you get to the job of editing because you want the text you're going to be editing as unfamiliar to yourself as possible. Yeah, yeah, that's really good advice. I mean, I've um, I've fallen into this trap before. Well, first of all, uh, doing the editing while you're writing, and it's just a slow progress that we've talked about before. And also, uh, I think you don't you actually get a much worse first draft because you're losing your train of thought each time you go into editing mode, yeah. and and so you, you know you're kind of shutting off that creative part of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I've found when I do do it in terms of just write write it out, I, I kind of like to use the term brain dump. So just get mm -hmm. everything out on paper and then put it aside and leave the editing for later. I've found stuff that I've written that I've come back to weeks later and in some instances actually been surprised. Did I write that? Yes, because that's actually pretty good yeah. <laughs> as it is, and I I realised that you know the first draft came out pretty good simply because I'd had a good day or whatever for whatever reason. But had I had I come back to edit it straight away, I probably would have tinkered with it a lot, um, or or if I had have edited it as I was going, it probably probably would have run out of steam a lot before that. So sometimes sometimes you can actually find that by leaving that pause and come back to it, that critical faculty has kind of been set aside. And if you then look at it from the point of view of the reader, uh, you may be actually pleasantly surprised. Yes, yes. Well, what I like to joke happens when you leave it sitting on your hard drive undisturbed for a couple of weeks is that the editing fairies go to work at it when you aren't looking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <And> that's <laughs> what makes it so much better. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, speaking of editing fairies, um, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I've started playing with an AI tool which does take small portions. I mean, you can only do up to 400 uh, characters which I find frustrating at times because I think it does a pretty good job. Um, it You can put 400 characters in and there's a bunch of different models that are based on whether it's a blog post intro or whether it's a, a, a promotional message, a marketing message, or whether it's a, an outline for a blog post or a YouTube video or various different things. There's a whole bunch of them um, that it, it then takes those 400 characters or the words of that and it transforms it through artificial intelligence and you can tell it you know give me five or ten variants and some of it's pretty impressive so 
do you um do you have any experience with that and what what do you view on those kind of tools for for the editing part oh interesting so it's editing or it's writing the software it's it's editing because you have to put in some information now some of it actually is writing so that there are ones where you can just put in the title of a blog post for example and it will it will a title and some keywords or something and it will spin up some ideas so it it won't write in that case it will just give you some other thought prompters so mm -hmm. it might be interesting if you're thinking or oh, what other ideas can can I generate from this this prompt um mm -hmm. but the ones the ones that I've played with are like for example a podcast description so I'll put the podcast description in there or a description of a workshop I'm running so I'll put the description in there which typically will be a short paragraph and then asked it to um, generate some variants of that and you can tell it you know what's the tone of voice you want to use you want to be friendly or strict or professional or um, empathetic is one that I put in a lot and then it comes it comes back with some edited variants of that uh, oh, and some of them some of them are quite impressive wow wow mm. no I haven't played with software like that the the software I use for editing I highly recommend and it's called pro writing aid that's all one word pro writing aid it's really really good um more people tend to be familiar with grammarly I think because grammarly is mm. more money on marketing I think pro writing aid is vastly superior to grammarly and it's less expensive it's i think it's about 70 dollars a year and they have sales three or four times a year so it's a really good piece of software um what might put people off is it looks a little bit intimidating but what i recommend to anyone who's giving it a try is just use it for one thing at a time for example it will identify all the passive voice you've used mm -hmm. and if you take it and get rid of all the passive voice you're going to improve your writing um, another thing it will do is it will instantly calculate your average number of words per sentence. Many people write sentences that are far too long. And so, <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> <laughs> so there is some inexpensive software on the internet or some free software on the internet. For example, the Hemingway app that mm. will mark all long sentences. But I don't like that because that software identifies or suggests that every long sentence is a problem. And that is not the case. It's actually a good idea to have a 50 word sentence in your, you know, a thousand word piece of text. What you don't want is nothing but 50 word mm. sentences. So I think it's far better to aim for an average sentence length of 14 to 18 words, have your occasional 50 word sentence, but balance it off with some one to five word sentences. And Pro Writing Aid will calculate that for you instantaneously. And if you're not in the 14 to 18 word range, then go back through your piece and shorten some of those sentences. Maybe split some of them in two, add a couple of one or two word sentences. There's lots of things you can do. But Pro Writing Aid is a really, really useful tool and it's really rich, really deep. Just learn it a little bit at a time. Hmm. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, so I'll have to take a look at that. Great. Well, I've just had a look at the clock and we've been going quite a while. I haven't <laughs> touched on on a couple of other things around repurposing content and so on, but maybe we'll have to follow up with another episode. <laughs> so I think it's a good point now, though, to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions, hopefully. Your answers will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. Okay. So what, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think that amounts to really caring about your customers. Hmm. So, for example, if I'm reading something, whether it's a book or a blog post that I know is going to interest one of my clients, then I'll email them about it. People really, really appreciate that kind of interaction. So it's, it's a really great way to make very, very loyal customers. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. I, I do that all the time. In fact, I just set up uh, somebody um, sent me an email 
as an example of the database they've set up, how they collect things when they, they find things. And I think, you know, this could be useful for a whole bunch of people that are in podcasting, for example. So podcasting is one of our, our areas. And, and so if I read something and I'm always reading things about podcasting, I can collect those rather than send them out right now because I just happen to see it right now. I can collect them and, and so I can um, come back and say, well, you know, once a week I want to contact my clients. And so here I have this database of information so I, I can go back to them and say, you know, just checking in, how you're doing. And by the way, I found this article that might be interesting for you. Uh, and I thought that's a brilliant idea because I was doing that anyway, but then I'd be really inefficient about it because then I'd kind of go back and what have I read recently that might interest that person as opposed to having the collection ready to go. Oh, great idea. Great idea. Mm. Okay, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Well, I have to say, I always get my best ideas from my customers. <laughs> so <laughs> I get really excited when someone says to me something like, have you ever thought of X, Y, Z? Yeah. And, and I think, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And so then I'll develop a product related to that. I, mm. I honestly say I get my best ideas from my customers. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a great way to do it, particularly for developing products, um, because you know if somebody's saying, have you ever thought about this or what would you do in this situation? I'm really frustrated by X, Y, yeah. and Z right now. Um, so then you know there's a real it's problem a there. Uh, yeah, and, and if you have the solution for that, you know that somebody's going to be happy about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? You mentioned Pro Writing Aid, but is is there another one or is that the favorite one? Well, I'd say for productivity, there are really two resources I use. One is the Pomodoro. Are you familiar with the Pomodoro? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I run my day. My day is a series of Pomodoros always. And then the other thing I use in combination with that is I use time blocking. So each morning when I set up what I'm going to do the day, I, I have a little form that I created in Microsoft Word and it divides the day into half hour segments. And I plan each morning what I'm going to be doing for every half hour. And whoa, Nellie, that has made me so much more productive. I had heard this for years that time blocking was really the secret to being incredibly productive. And I thought, oh, I, I can't do that. I get so many calls. I have so many emails, blah, blah, blah. But then as soon as I tried it, it is absolutely like magic. Really yeah. So, so how's, um, I mean, I've used time blocking and I, 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 well, I use time blocking and I have used Pomodoro, but how, how are the two different? Because I see, I mean, to me, Pomodoro is kind of just a variant of, of the time blocking. Well, I guess the thing is with the Pomodoro is you're supposed to be concentrating just on one thing when you're doing mm. the Pomodoro. And so my way of dealing with the myriad of tiny, fast to do things I have okay. to do yeah. every day is I put them together in a 30 minute chunk. So I mm. usually have two of those 30 minute chunks per day to just do what I call short snappers. So I have a list. And I'll work my way through as many as I can in 30 minutes. Hmm. So that's that's probably not a Pomodoro because I'm doing more than one thing. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. um, it fits in well with the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand really that. Yeah, and and that's, I mean, I like that. I, I kind of do something very similar to that. And the, the beauty of that one, and I still get caught out on this, I still get distracted. But the beauty of that is if you've got 10 or 12 um, small things that, you need to do unless they're super important if they're super important then um, they're going to move the needle in a big way then they get for me they get a different time block but you know th those usually are administrative things and if the half hour is up you stop so mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've done five of the ten you stop yeah. and that that's the challenge for me still i kind of i see that list and i think oh there's another five to go i'll just keep going until i've ticked them all off and the danger with that of course is there's there's other perhaps more important tasks there right. that that, that right. you're eating into their time then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The best thing about time blocking is that some mornings it's apparent to me that I don't have anywhere near the amount of time I need to do all the things I have to do. 
So at 6.30 in the morning, I'm able to make a decision about what things I'm knocking off my list and what ones I'm actually realistically going to be able to do. Far more powerful to make the decision about what you're going to do than just let fate decide that mm. for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've got this system where I have a one, three, five, and and then I combine that with time blocking. So the one, three, five, so there's one activity, three activities, five activities. And uh, the one activity is the one I absolutely must do today. And if that's the only one I get done today, I'm, I'm happy. I, I've, I've achieved. That's, that's right. been good. Um, and if I complete that one, then I move on to the three. And usually they'll be, um, from a time point of view also, they'll be of that relative scale. Um, and that way, and I've got it set up in a Kanban board every morning and I can see it. So then, you know, like today, for example, there were about seven, I think, in my one category. So <laughs> and I haven't done my planning yet for the day. So I've got to go back there and clearly six of those are not going to get done today and they're yeah. going to get removed from that list. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm. But it's great that you can remove them rather than just discover at the end of the day that you didn't get everything done. That's right, yeah. <laughs> All right, now what's the best way to keep a client on track? Um, I think it's to figure out what their real need is and then just keep reminding them of it. You know, I have a system with my writing program where people have to fill out what they did each day. And if I haven't had the report from them, I email them and say, you haven't reported yet today. Please let me know what you did. Hmm. And, um, you know, a great many people tell me that the only reason they wrote on a particular day was because they knew they were going to get an email from me. If they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a, a level of accountability as well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I love it. And I, I guess, you set that expectation up front so that they yeah. know that's, yes, that's exactly. what's going to happen. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Great. All right. And what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Well, I think, I mean, I think the thing I can say is what I do to differentiate myself because there are a lot of writers and editors out there in internet land and so the way I differentiate myself is I focus more on the psychology of writing rather than the how-to of it. And I mm. think that's a, a, a little thing that many people, as soon as they hear it, they think, oh, that might be able to help me because they're not that many people who approach writing in that way. A lot of people approach writing from the point of view of how to fix your grammar or how to do this or how to do that. And I'm basically about the psychology of writing. So I found that finding a slightly different niche makes my services um, more attractive to people. Hmm. And I think, I mean, I, I've got a view that I, I think that is so much more useful to take the content that you're the expert in and combine it with that mindset. I mean, we talked earlier about, you know, how... We're sort of all programmed to be negative on ourselves and mm -hmm. 4,000 words a minute that we tell yeah. ourselves unconsciously. Yeah. So I think combining the mindset with the expertise that you have and sharing the expertise is a really valuable thing to provide. Um, there's, there's so many, whether it's writing or whether it's any other skill, there's so much stuff out there. And I've um, I've taken courses where... I've gotten really excited by their marketing material. And then when I've gotten into the course, I've perhaps picked up a few uh, pieces of information that were new to me that I learnt and perhaps were helpful. But it's very much mechanical in terms of, you know, here's what you do. Step one's this, step two's that, step three's that. And, and now I know, you know, part of my problem, if I'm struggling with something, part of my problem is, is that mindset thing is the psychology of it it's not necessarily okay i may not know the best way to do it and that will certainly be helpful to learn from somebody else a better way than what i'm doing but the mindset part always needs to be addressed somewhere yes yes indeed i i guess one of the things i like to say is that i'm not serving people a fish dinner i'm teaching people how to fish yeah yeah 
yeah that's uh and i can't remember who first said that yeah teach teach people to fish yeah i think it came from the bible actually so <laughs> mm. all right well thanks daphne this has been fabulous now where can people find out more about you and and get a hold of your book and perhaps even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today sure and the place to go is my website which is www.publicationcoach.com. And I have a newsletter that goes out free of charge every Tuesday, goes to subscribers all around the world. So if anyone's interested in learning more about the kinds of ideas that I write about and I promote, sign up for my newsletter. I, I uh, don't send out anything else. You'll just get the newsletter every week and uh, many people find it very, very helpful to developing their own writing practices. Yeah, and there's there's quite um, an extensive collection of videos on your YouTube channel as well. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And if you poke around at my website a bit, you'll find all the blog posts I've sent out for the last 15 years, I think it's been now. And uh, yeah, I started doing video podcasts in 2017, so all the videos are there as well. There is a library of stuff that's free of charge that you can happily explore on my website. <laughs> Great. And we'll we'll link to that in the show notes so people can click straight through. Great. So do you have some parting advice as we wrap this up, Daphne? Well, I guess I would say because, you know, people who are writing often are dealing with short de deadlines. I was going to say deadlines, frequently really short deadlines. And I would say when you are managing your time, always be prepared to allow more time than you think conceivable. People do themselves a disservice when they try to do something faster because they think they ought to be able to do it faster. Um, one of the leaders in this field is the uh, psychologist and Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. He, he's the one who developed the, uh, the theory of the planning fallacy. And one of the core tenets of the planning fallacy is that if we discover we've underestimated the amount of time we need to spend, we still tend to cling really tightly to that original deadline. So we might give ourselves two hours more instead of two weeks more or even two months more. So really give yourself lots of time to do whatever job it is you need to do. It's uh, You're not doing yourself any favors by trying to cut that time too short. I'm working with a, uh, a couple of women right now who have a book they need to get to a publisher and it was originally, you know, it's supposed to be 80,000 words and it was supposed to be at the publisher at the end of March, I think. And um, now they know they've, they've negotiated the end of May. And I think, hmm, not sure that's quite enough time. <laughs> but anyways, be sure you give yourself enough time. And if you need to renegotiate an agreement so that, that you get more time, make sure you really negotiate enough time to do mm. that. Because... Trying to do something in too short an amount of time is not going to be a happy experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm in one of those situations at the moment where I I <laughs> negotiated some more time and didn't negotiate enough time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it's yeah, it's a little embarrassing having to go back and say, well, I still haven't finished. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah mm. Indeed. All right. Well, uh, finally, who else should I get on this show and why? Well, you know, I have a friend, his name is Dave Dorgy, and he is, uh, he's a sports marketing guru, but he is reinventing himself as a writer right now. And, mm -hmm. you know, the thing is, he has a lot of really great stories. He's worked in very, very senior levels. He, uh, he does, he's done sports marketing for a number of Olympics. He, I think he did it for the London Olympics. He did it for the Vancouver Olympics. I think he's done it for a couple of other Olympics games as well. And um, But he's wanting to be a book writer now, and he's just had another book published. It's on keeping bees, and mm. it's a charming book. It's lovely, and he's negotiating with, uh, with his publisher right now to do another book. But he has lots of great ideas, lots of interesting stories, and... Um, lots of insights on how you can reinvent yourself uh, in a different career relatively late in life. So I, I think he would be a really great guest. All right. Well, we'll reach out to Dave and get an introduction from you and uh, see if we can bring him on the show as well. 
Great. forward to that. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much for sharing your insights with us so generously today and so many tips about writing and editing and how to come up with ideas and keep them flowing and how to manage the time when you're doing doing the writing and the editing. So thanks, Daphne. All the best for the future and let's stay in touch. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful and informative conversation with Daphne and took something away from her episode. I love Daphne's focus on both the process of writing and the tools she's developed, as well as the mindset of a writer. I'm really curious to know what you took away from Daphne's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Daphne Gray Grant. That is D-A-P-H-N-E. G-R-A-Y-G-R-A-N-T, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Daphne Gray Grant. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Daphne, as well as links to the Publication Coach website, her book, Your Happy First Draft, the Publication Coach YouTube channel, Daphne's social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. If you like this episode, do share it with two other people so that it can help others. Tag me in on that share and I'll reach out to you with a special thank you. Daphne suggested that we have a conversation with sports marketer turned writer and publisher Dave Dorigy on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Dave, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of Daphne Gray Grant. Tune in again to the next episodes of the InnovaBuzz podcast. We've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including business operations architect Sidel Stewart and author, speaker and founder of Smart Hustle Media, Ramon Ray. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.